Have you guys ever played a game where hours go by like minutes? Where you're so engrossed in what you're doing that when you're not playing, all you can do is think about getting back into the game. Uh-oh, people are dying of dehydration. Well, that's what this medieval city building survival game, Farthest Frontier, has been for me for this past week. It's kind of like someone said, hey, why don't we make an Anno game but combine it with that childhood scarring Oregon Trail game where your whole family dies of dysentery. So yeah, uh, big emphasis on survival. But there's a lot more to this game, and even though it's an early access, there's a lot to love about this and a lot to keep you busy. So hey guys, I'm Morphologist, and in my day job, if you guys don't know, I work as an architect designing buildings and homes. And together with the amazing team that I work with, we've designed projects all around the world in the US, Spain, and Taiwan, which is where I currently live. When I'm out of the studio though, I love bringing my professional work home to my passion of gaming and uh, talking about architecture as it relates to gaming. And, and that's kind of like what I want to do here tonight, talking about Farthest Frontier, or today rather, whatever time it is for you. Uh, because this really scratches that itch that I've been wanting to scratch for urban planning that I've not scratched in a while. So a lot of itches and scratches, I guess. So in a moment, I'm going to take you guys through a little show and tell because uh, I guess this game makes me feel like a kid again. Like back when I used to play SimCity 3000 for hours and just lose track of time after I got home from school. One other thing that might help scratch an itch though is the sponsor of today's video, Audible. With my day job doing architecture and this YouTube slash streaming thing I do when I get home, I really don't have very much time to sit down and read anymore, which is why I love Audible, which can help me escape some of the stress of the day while I'm working out or while I'm on the way to the studio with amazing audiobooks like the Stormlight series. Yeah, recommending this again because it's actually amazing. It stuck with me as probably one of my favorite stories maybe ever? So if you're interested in that or any other kind of audiobook, head on over to audible.com slash morphologist and use code morphologist or text morphologist to 500 and get the first book in the series, The Way of Kings, for free and start your 30-day free Audible membership trial. If the Stormlight audiobook series aren't for you though, you can always check out other amazing audiobooks like The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan with the one credit you'll get towards any audiobook every single month as a member. And by the way, if you don't know, Brandon Sanderson, the author of the Stormlight series, actually helped finish that series for Robert Jordan after he passed away, unfortunately. It was, it was really sad when I heard, found that out, but I was so excited to see that such an amazing author picked up the last few books. So it's really good. Check it out if you guys are interested. So what is Furthest Frontier? Well, full disclosure, it is actually an early access game, but it's really far along in development. So if you're worried about there not being much to do and being a lot of bugs, that's really not an issue with this. It's a game, though, where you write the story of a band of medieval-esque pioneers who set out to create a new life on the frontier of somewhere. It kind of looks like medieval Europe, but they're not super clear on that, and it's not really important. The backstory is, you know, they felt really oppressed by the wealthy royals of their kingdom and they wanted to leave and find a better life somewhere else. And that's where you come in, you're the leader of this band of merry travelers and you want to build a new city for them. And it's a lot of fun doing this. Now there is a huge emphasis though on this game's survival aspect, so if you have played city building games before, maybe you won't be used to this kind of gameplay because there are a lot of ways for all of your people to die suddenly and horribly, either through wildlife attacking them or the elements freezing them to death or raiders robbing and killing them and stealing their stuff. There's just a lot of stuff that can go wrong very early on and even in the very late game when things start to get much harder with invading armies. Luckily though, the game gives you a couple different choices for you to start off with to kind of make the experience a little bit easier for you if you're really new to this type of game, which I was. So I actually tried to challenge myself a little bit and started with the right in the smack dab middle. Kind of challenging, but not too challenging, the trailblazer stuff. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. What's not maybe self-explanatory though is the stuff like the map size and the terrain. You have a couple different types of maps which automatically generate different configurations. It's kind of like an auto-generation system, so every time you play, you get something a little bit new. The map size, I think, probably has to do with performance. I'm not totally sure, but I went with the biggest size because I wanted to have as many resources as possible and have the ability to expand out my city as much as I wanted. But if you don't want to worry about getting raided, you can always check mark the pacifist button so you don't ever get attacked. But I think it's kind of cool to have to deal with being attacked every so often. It gives the experience a little bit more uh, excitement for me anyway. 
Now because the maps are automatically generated, it's always a different experience for where you think you should place down your town center, which is the first building you need to select the location of when you're starting off any new game of the farthest frontier. And it can be a make or break situation depending on whether or not you place it on top of a wolf den or on top of a, a well fertilized and you know water rich environment like this one right here. You can toggle in between these as you look around to try to find the optimal location. And this is kind of really cool because you know in city planning and urban planning and even architecture you want to find the best site for your building to take advantage of the environment, like the sun location, uh, natural resource locations, a lake location. And so I love that there's so much thought that's going into this game, even right off the bat. So I, I know that it can be a lot of fun to just reroll this map over and over again, just to get different versions of it to find like the perfect one that kind of fits your vision of the city that you want to build. They give you a couple tools to toggle in between the resources, like I can hit the F3 button to kind of see if there are deer nearby and to see the name tags of the deer, like or if there's boar or wolves, because wolves can kill people and boars and even bears will attack and kill your people, so you don't want to place your towns that are too near to dangerous wildlife. And then you can also toggle in between, obviously, the uh, resources too. There's a resource button that allows you to see the amount of resources in your given area, so it's good to also locate your your location or your town center near uh, some really good resources like a forest with some uh, with some stone in it, maybe a fertile field for planting later on. All this plays a role and I just love the amount of planning that you have to do here, even just right when you get started. After you found the perfect location with the best kinds of resources that you need, now comes the part where you need to just survive. At least for the first couple of years, you're just trying to make it to, you know, to the point where you've got a sustainable amount of food and stuff coming in and so you've got to build shelters to survive the winter because there are seasons in this and you've got to find different types of food resources so that you're always getting some food to stock up and prepare for the winter and stuff really even just starts to get more advanced from there because your people will be concerned with things like the food sources and how many there are the shelter that they have shoes and clothes that they're able to use to keep warm entertainment beer to keep them pacified and luxury items later on to keep them even more happy and to attract more people to come to your town, village, and eventually city so that you get more tax revenue later on. Once you get past the basics of survival, you know, just having shelters for you to survive, a well for you to get water, and maybe some uh, hunters like this guy right here and the forager shack to collect some various resources around the map for you to collect some basic forged food, then is where the fun starts, where you can start to build some other stuff to really make your city grow. And really, the building part of this game is the part that I really, really enjoy as an architect and one that went to school which specialized in urban planning, like I said before. Planning out this city has been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of trial and error with earlier saves, but I feel like I'm getting to the point where I kind of understand how everything is supposed to work together. So let me give you a little bit of a tour here so you can kind of see what an end game version of this looks like and all the complexities associated with the building and uh, the locations of buildings and that importance. Uh, so moving over, and we'll, we'll get back to the decorations in a moment, to the in industrious sector, or the industrial sector, excuse me. You can see here now a more advanced version of what you s just saw on the earlier map. You can see here now I've got a much more advanced wood chopper out here chopping wood a lot faster than before. I've got a much more advanced uh, set of woodworking shops. I've got a better sawmill making better planks faster. I've got a furniture shop making expensive nice furniture that I can sell in the markets. I've even got stuff like this, uh, this more advanced Fletcher shop making better bows and even some crossbows which are a bit more powerful for hunting and defending the city we'll go over that in a moment a better stockyard uh, a wagon shop wagon shops actually help you transport larger loads of goods because if, if you actually saw what the people were collecting in the earlier version of this map uh, you could see that they were only carrying like one stone per trip these wagons can carry massive loads a little bit slower than people but Overall, they're far more efficient, so the more wagons you have, and there are two per wagon shop, the better you're going to be. Actually, this is not a wagon shop, this is a candle shop, uh, excuse me. There's the wagon shop, alright. Uh, the candle shop can make candles from stuff like wax, and the wax comes from the uh, this thing right here, which is called a... Ah, an apiary, yes, weird name. Apiaries are for bees, and bees produce honey and wax. Wax can be used for candles, and candles can be used to light homes and make people happy, but also can be used to sell on the market 
and the honey can be used along with your crops such as wheat to make beer, and beer also makes people happy. Beer can be served then in a pub like this one right here, which when located towards or inside of your residential area can make the people there happy. They've got a place to go and hang out in the afternoon or after work, and it keeps them relatively pacified. Too many bars though makes people work less efficiently, which I've discovered because they tend to go to the bar instead of work, and there's not much you can do to stop them from doing that other than just not having too many of these. But you have other options for entertainment like a theater right here to keep people happy. Now, this industrial sector, what's really cool about this and what's more advanced than just, say, making it look good is the way everything works together and how its placement is really important. So, for example, I've got the foundry right here, which takes raw ore mined outside of the city and converts it into ingots. Those ingots can then be used to forge things like weapons, tools, and heavy tools, which help other parts of the industry. And the armor can actually also produce defenses for your garrison, and the garrison is something that you can only afford, this is the uh, garrison over here, you can only really afford to equip them and pay them after you're a little bit more advanced with your city. And so all of this is working together in the background, you're trying to balance the different incomes of ore and wood and and uh, you know food to make sure everything is going to flow smoothly and that you constantly have a supply of the different things that your people need and the different things that your industry needs. Things can rot because food can uh, like uh, eventually uh, expire because there are no ref refrigerators. So you have to have things like uh, root cellars and uh, you have to have a thing like a cooper, a place like a cooper. They build barrels to, oh, can I, I can accept these guys. Come on in. I've got some spare homes for you. Wow, we're up to 293. That's crazy. Anyway, so uh, the coopers will build barrels and those can be used to keep extra food for longer, which is again, really, really important. Uh, you've got the smokehouse, which can help smoke things like fish and meat that you are able to hunt or fish in the nearby lakes and ponds to keep your food even longer. It just, there's so much complexity to this. Down to things like programmatic adjacency, which is something that we talk about in architecture and even in urban planning, where you're trying to select the best locations for different elements of your design, uh, different important parts like, uh, for example, like the trading center and the storage warehouse. The warehouse is where you keep products that you produce and the trade hub is where you sell them. So having them located closely to one another helps you restock faster. And then all the wood related items like the sawmill and the furniture maker and even the uh, bow maker are all located in the same general area because they're all again using the same materials. This helps them increase their efficiency because they're physically transporting this stuff between each other. Even stuff like the crops have their own super complex mini game to them that I just don't have enough time to really fully go over. But you can see that there are different crop rotations for different fields and each one of these crops brings with it you know, different types of yields and tolerances, and uh, they will detrimentally affect your field. Like if you only plant stuff like wheat on your field, your fertility will go all the way down. So you won't be able to have any yield of resources on those fields. You'll have to then swap them over to say stuff like clover, which will bring the fertility back up again, where you can start planting. Or you can have a really good rotation like this one right here, which I regard as the perfect field because it only very rarely drops in fertility. Unfortunately, though, I had a problem with the beans, uh, with the disease, because uh, there were too many beans on this field and it started to spread, so I had to add some uh, radish here. But if I were to swap this out with beans again, it would be a, a perfect field. It would never drop fertility. So that's kind of a, a great combination if you guys are interested in, in that. But there's just so much to this. And then if you want to increase fertility on land, you can also you know, employ the cows that you have to graze on the land to raise that fertility so you can start planting crops efficiently again. Again, there's just so much complexity in this game. And it's just so interesting to plan this stuff out. You've also got stuff like markets. Markets actually help uh, buy and sell goods for your people. So your people, all, all these green homes in this area, people who live in these homes will actually go to this market and buy and sell goods, trade between different members of the community, and those trades actually yield you uh, amount of income from taxes 
on each trade. So you can see my income up here is actually partially to do with the fact that I've got these higher level markets located throughout the city with a good enough coverage. You can see this, this line, this outline right here actually indicates the coverage that this actually allows for. So any homes outside of this, unfortunately, aren't being really taxed. They don't have any available place for them to buy and sell goods. So it's really good to plan out your city where you've got places to put things like markets. But you also have to consider things like schools to keep people educated. Uh, a good hospital location located near the center of the city where the roads lead to it so that people can be healed efficiently uh, to prevent the spread of horrible diseases which are very prevalent in this game especially later on with big cities like this where you've got a lot of food and a lot of people and therefore there can be a lot of things like rats and those rats carry you guessed it the bubonic plague which did break out earlier but i was able to catch it by uh quarantining people in the hospital and stopping it from spreading and killing the entire city that that's the black death if you guys don't know what that is um, I'm not sure what you learned in school, but you should look it up. It's pretty horrifying. Uh, so, uh, later on then, once you actually start to, you know, get your in in industry sector working really, really well, everything's well supplied, you can start making your city more beautiful. And the more beautiful your city is, um, the more attractive it is, the more desirable it is, the more people it's going to attract to your city. So your city will grow faster and your your actual buildings will also upgrade depending on the desirability. So you can see here right now, I'm at tier three. There's one more tier after this, tier four. And at that level, the homes start to be built out of brick with nice clay roof tiles. And it looks really, really nice. So, you know, part of this game is also making sure that your city is not only well oiled, but also looks really good. So more people want to come. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to look like this, but you know, I love design, so I wanted to make like a grand entrance, but there's a little bit of a method to my madness here. Like, I think there's also an aspect of trying to design your city well against, you know, invaders, because uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but you can be invaded by armies and raiders. And so if you've got poor defenses and poorly designed and poorly placed towers, you can be easily overcome or they can be easily overcome and you can start to lose things because they'll, they'll go straight after things like your granary storage. They'll go after your... Uh, your people, um, they'll go after your crops, they'll go after everything that they can get their hands on. So you want to have adequate defenses to prevent that from happening. I designed these 90 degree turns in anticipation, for example, of battering rams. I don't know if that's going to actually work in this game, but you know, in, in history, they actually designed switchbacks and narrow passageways before you got to the entrances of castles, keeps, and walled cities to prevent things like big siege engines from getting too close to the city and being able to get through or over the walls or through the doors. So I've kind of tried to design this around medieval um, uh, medieval designs where you have like double door entrances to slow down uh, invaders to make it uh, a, a lot more painful them for them to try to break in to your city. But I could really go on about the design of this game and how everything works together for hours. I can make tutorials on each of these individually. It really kind of deserves tutorials for every element of this game to fully explain it. But I don't have enough time for that sadly in this video and that's not really the purpose of it. I wanted to give you guys a brief overview of the game and this kind of show and tell because I'm really excited about it and I hope you guys found something interesting here and maybe if you're interested you could check it out on Steam. Uh, if you want to wait because it's an early access I understand but there's a lot here to enjoy and they're going to be updating this a lot in the next few months. There are a few minor bugs and issues with balance in terms of resources but they've said that they're going to try to address these things. They're going to add more decorations. Um, they're going to add diagonal walls which aren't in the game yet. There's some small things that just need to be improved. And I think this is going to be a golden game. It's really going to be amazing, especially after the modding support comes in, which has been confirmed. So I want to see things like maybe a Witcher mod where you can have like a, a Witcher school and you have maybe like bog witches that you have to deal with or something like that. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of really cool possibilities with this game. So if you guys like this kind of video and you want to see more like this on my channel, please let me know by hitting the like subscribe button and commenting because this is not something I typically produce here. If this video doesn't get a whole lot of traction, I probably won't be able to justify revisiting it on my channel, but I'll probably keep playing it on my own because I really enjoy it. So if you want to see more stuff like this, let me know. But you can also check out my Twitch channel because I did a three part series on there that will eventually disappear with the VODs. So you can check out part one, two and three, which will go over like a, a beginning, middle and end if you want to see that. But otherwise, I hope you guys found this interesting and fun. If you did, let me know. I've been Morphologist. I'll see you guys in the next one.